I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Rita Smith. I am a co-chair of the Leadership Council for the Center on Domestic Violence, housed at the School of Public Affairs, University of Colorado, Denver. Um, it was formed um, and founded over 20 years ago by Barbara Paradiso, um, an amazing advocate who worked for over 40 years in this uh, space, uh, local program, a director of Boulder Safe House, and then came to the center um, uh, to create this amazing educational opportunity for people. Um, so uh, just wanted to, uh, to bring her name forward uh, to recognize the gift that she's created and given to us and hopefully we can carry it on uh, with the grace and the vision that, um, that it deserves. Uh, this particular um, education series uh, was originally planned to be with a cohort uh, students um, and with Barb's death, we had to revise, but we felt like the topic was really, really critical and we wanted to make sure that it got covered. We have some amazing presenters today, um, people who have really great experience uh, working within the Asian uh, Pacific Islander communities uh, over the course of uh, decades, some of them. Um, both uh, national and local representation here in Denver, um, uh, the Asian Pacific Development Center um, is our local resource here. And then uh, the Asian Pacific uh, Institute on uh, gender-based violence is our national connection here. Um, so we will be, uh, we, we will be uh, doing a two-part session. This session is kind of the, the opening um, session for us where we are uh, uh, looking at a broader perspective on the issues of the intersectionality of oppressions um, and with the um, in increased violence that happened with Asian Pacific Islanders during COVID. Um, it's really important for us to understand those intersections and to understand how we can be really helpful uh, to that community and to support the services that are, are provided there. Uh, so uh, Monica, um, Modi Kant uh, is uh, the executive director of the API Institute on Gender-Based Violence. Um, she's a national expert, um, works um, uh, on inter Im immigration law and the uh, intersection between immigrant rights, uh, human trafficking, domestic violence, sexual assault, and asylum. Um, and Shirley Lowe is the um, uh, uh, resource coordinator at API, uh, the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. Um, and uh, analyzes their data, does training for them, um, and helps to connect the national network of um, service providers um, within the Asian Pacific Islander um, communities, as well as connecting to state coalitions to help uh, broaden their information about these resources. And our local, um, our local um, connection here is Newman Lee, who um, is the Victim Assistance Director at the Asian Pacific Development Center. Um, she's done this work over a decade. Um, worked at the Adams County uh, District Attorney's Office and was a trafficking intern at the Colorado Organization for Victim Assistance before coming to um, uh, the Asian Pacific Development Center. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to the experts here. Um, I wanna uh, uh, invite you all to chat with each other um, which you all are doing already, <laughs> skill, skill groups that we have here. But the thing we would hope that you can do is if you have questions for the presenters, please put that in the question and answer chat box um, because that's a little easier for us to respond to um, and to keep track of them. So we make sure that, that we get as many questions and answers as we can. It's hard to pull them out of the chat box sometimes. So uh, please just do it in the question and answer um, um, area. And then we make sure we can get as much information to you all as you want or need. Um, so um, I, I hope that um, you all enjoy this, that you find something helpful in your work in your local communities. Um, and that you learn how to be a better ally in this space because that's really what, uh, what the end goal is here. So thank you for coming. Uh, turn it over to I have Monica Kant. Uh, um, thank you, Monica, go ahead. Um, thank you all so much for having us. Um, this has been 
you know, a few months of discussion and progress. We started off initially by speaking with Barbara and, you know, um, we're deeply saddened to hear about, you know, her passing. And when, you know, we restarted the discussions again, we were really excited and, you know, I'm grateful to speak with um, you all as well. And so thank you to the Center on Domestic Violence and the University of Colorado for having us. I'd, um, before I start introductions, I would love for all of you to maybe in the chat, I know you've already been a little bit active, but just, you know, introduce yourself, say where you're from, so that we also get a sense um, of who our audience is. I know during Zoom time, it's really difficult to know um, sometimes, you know, who's uh, behind the screen. And so uh, we would love it if you could just share with us. And so um, the presenters from our end today, from the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence will be myself. Um, and um, as you know, Rita had mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Asian Pacific um, Institute on Gender-Based Violence. And also Shirley um, Luau, who is our HHS resource coordinator, who is really such an expert um, in this work and has been with us for uh, four years um, plus doing this work. And, you know, our goal today really is to give you a broad picture of gender-based violence in the Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander community. It's really important, you know, as a culturally specific resource center that we do give the time and attention, especially now in the light of a lot of um, most recent news reports that have really come out, you know, and I'll say this time and time again throughout the presentation, there's been violence against the AAPI community for centuries. However, there's been a light and a focus put on it most recently in the last few years, especially um, with you know, the pandemic and with the rise of anti-AAPI hate. And so what we will be talking about has a little bit more significance now because it's up front and center in our minds. And you know, that is something that we hope to really unpack for you all today so that next Next week, you all can come, you know, and join in on the 27th, where we even do a deeper discussion and dive. Um, so, all right, as you all are sharing um, where you all are from, uh, I would love to also just give a shout out, like I had started uh, doing before, to um, Rita, to Jane, to Emma, and to Monica Bees for um, having us today. They are the force uh, behind um, this and making this happen. And of course, this was Barbara's idea. And so um, we wanna make sure we honor and recognize her by you know, uh, doing a great presentation today. And then finally, as Rita mentioned, Monica Bees will be monitoring Q&A for questions and will periodically um, be sharing them with us. So we wanna make sure we respond to your questions throughout the presentation. Um, our next slide will also go over the agenda. And um, the agenda um, today is really just talking about our community and gender-based violence, uh, who is our community, what is gender-based violence, and we'll talk about the cultural um, dynamics and system barriers as well to AAPI um, survivors of gender-based violence receiving the resources and care that they need and also the emerging trends in activism. And we're really excited to pass it on to new men from the Asian Pacific Development Center right there in your neighborhood in Colorado, talking about what will be happening um, you know, in the community in Colorado to really bring it home. And so that will be our agenda for today. And we're just grateful that you're here with us. Um, so, okay. Uh, without further ado, I will go ahead and start and tell you a little bit about the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. You know, we have our mission and vision right up there on the slide. And so I will always uh, say our mission because I think it's important to start off. But our mission at APIGBB 
is to disrupt gender-based violence, which causes physical, sexual, emotional, spiritual, and economic harm within the AAPI communities throughout the U.S. and territory. And as a National Resource Center, and we are one of three culturally specific resource centers funded by um, HHS, with the, which is Health and Human Services, there's one for the Latinx population called um, Casa Esperanza, which is now known as Esperanza United, and there's one for the Black population called Ujima, and we are the ones, API GBV, for the Asian Pacific um, Islander group. And so uh, our goal is to be that national resource center that, um, you know, receives and assists um, community-based organizations on the ground who are providing direct services to victims of gender-based violence and other forms of violence in the AAPI community. And we also take what is happening on the ground and we work with policymakers, with the White House, with um, state coalitions to really, um, you know, fully answer and explain what is happening in our community so that if laws and policies are passed, if funding is you know, divided up, then we can be a voice for our community and make sure that our community receives, you know, um, and their challenges are directly explained, you know, to organizations and agencies that can make a difference. In doing that work, uh, we have many resources. Our, we are tasked to creating resources specific to the AAPI community. I joined the Institute six months ago as their executive director, but before then I was um, for 15 years an executive director at a direct services organization. And I have to say, I knew of the Institute in my previous roles because I would always go to their website where they had resources on human trafficking, domestic violence, sexual assault in certain communities. And those resources are important when you need to provide data points, when you need to provide descriptions um, and resources on gender-based violence. And so that's why API GBV in my past role was really a support and a great organization that had those resources. So you, if you ever need more information, feel free to look at our website, feel free to contact one of us because we may have it and it can help you. Um, next slide, Shirley. So we've been, um, you know, the API GBV has been around for about 20 years. We're a staff of 12. We do a lot with technical assistance training, which is what we're doing today, capacity building with the organizations, and then also with um, you know, creating policies and affecting policies state, locally, and also nationally as well. And then we also um, you know, do some organizational uplifting as well with the community-based organizations that do the work. And so in doing that, it's really important that we engage with our stakeholders, we engage with educational, system, educational institutions such as yourselves so that we can mobilize the community and making sure that we all collectively respond to gender-based violence. Um, and so now um, I am going to be passing it along to uh, Shirley, who will be telling you a little bit more about um, the AAPI community. But before I do that, Monica Bees, are there any questions? I don't think so. There and I have no questions yet. Yeah. And I have to say, Monica, before we go further, I love being on a webinar with another Monica because that's <laughs> very often. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Shirley. All right. Thank you, Monica and Monica. Um, Monica, Kent, and I are going to go back and forth a couple of times today uh, throughout our presentation. So if you do have questions, um, we will, um, as they said, um, be able to get to them kind of in between our sections. So before we really get into the topic of GBV or gender-based violence, we wanted to take some time to set a little bit of context and talk about what we mean when we say AAPI, sometimes we say API, um, Asians and Pacific Islanders or Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So of course the term is very fluid and not everybody from the highlighted areas that you're seeing on this map um, may consider themselves AAPI, but just very broadly, here's what's often included within the AAPI identity. And you can see that it's a, a 
tremendously large expanse all the way from West Asia, um, what you know you would, you would also refer to as the Middle East to the Pacific Islands. Uh, so I'm not going to read this slide, but I think even at a glance, you can see just how many different ethnic and racial backgrounds there are represented. So there's the Central Asians, East Asians, Hawaiians and Pacific Islands, uh, Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, Southeast Asians, South Asians, and the West Asians. Um, and of course, you can imagine that the experiences of somebody who is from uh, you know, Japan, for instance, would be very different from the experience of somebody who is Nepalese. Um, and while we do use the term AAPI out of uh, just convenience, I guess, or habit, um, and while a lot of these groups may share customs and norms across their identities. The term AAPI really does encompass just a tremendous diversity of identities. It's not a monolith, it's very um, diverse in fact. And so here you can see how many uh, languages the AAPI diaspora speaks. There's over 70 languages and dialects represented here. And on and on this would go, right? If you're looking at different religions, if you're looking at different immigration and refugee experiences, if you're looking at cultural practices, cultural norms. So um, uh, AAPIs or at least um, Asians are thought of as being very successful in this country um, often, but that's always looking at data sets when you kind of lump the whole AAPI community together. If you're breaking it down by race or ethnicity, the disparities start to show up more. So um, what you're seeing on the screen here is from 2018 data. And we're seeing that while Indians um, over in the yellow bar uh, in the US uh, are above the national average uh, median annual median income of 63,000, uh, the same isn't true across all AAPI groups. And so groups like the Burmese and the Hmong, for instance, historically represent some of the lowest incomes and the highest poverty rates, um, the highest levels of disparity within the US. And of course, you'll see what's missing are the Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And that's something that we see very often is that they're, they're often left out of studies entirely because of their numbers are relatively small. So all that to say that, um, you know, if you break down the AAPI community further um, past this monolithic AAPI label, you'll see the disparities um, are, are very present. Similarly, uh, looking at how our communities were impacted by COVID, uh, we can see that uh, Filipino nurses represented one third of COVID related deaths uh, among nurses um, through September 2020 in the US, even though they only made up 4% of nurses in the US. Um, and then vaccination rates for Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians are consistently uh, they consistently lag behind rates for Asian Americans. And the question is why, right? It could be they're not getting the info. It could be um, the info is not in their languages. They don't have access, um, cultural factors. It could be a combination of reasons and likely is a combination of reasons. Um, and so in our work, we, we really think it's so important to kind of um, to disaggregate uh, just for these reasons. Uh, the Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islander communities throughout the past year and a half have been the hardest hit by COVID. And this is on top of uh, existing health disparities within the community. So I, the reason we're bringing this up is because it all matters, right? Survivors of violence, their experiences, the choices that they have, how their communities and families react to them, uh, whether they're able to find the care and the help uh, that they need for the violence that they experienced. It's all impacted by their background, by the disparities they face or their communities face, by the cultural and community norms that they're surrounded by. And we will talk about some of that next, or rather Monica will, as I pass it back to her. Thank you, Shirley. And I think, you know, uh, Thank you so much, Shirley, for that information, because 
she's absolutely right. I think when you think of the API community, you may be thinking of the model minority. You may be thinking of, you know, those success stories or, you know, when you watch ER, there's a, you know, um, there's a few API uh, physicians and you hear about that, but there really is a diversity within this uh, community as well in terms of sec so socioeconomic status, um, you know, and also um, the, uh, the rate where, um, you know, success can be, uh, you know, uh, accomplished. And so I think, you know, that's really important to note. And often when you see data points, um, Asians, it is, as Shirley said, diluted, you know, and it um, doesn't show those hard hit communities in our population that really need um, assistance and resources and need that extra given care. Because if we project this image that everyone in the AAPI community is successful and fine and don't need, you know, assistance, then we really are doing a disservice to those community members who do. And so I'm really grateful that Shirley had an opportunity to highlight those points with you and, you know, keep it in the front of mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. And so here we are to the meat and potatoes about what is gender-based violence. You know, and gender-based violence is violence. This is, you know, the definition, violence directed at an individual based on his or her biological sex or gender identity. This includes physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, economic or financial, educational deprivation types of abuse. It is also violence that is rooted in exploiting unequal power due to gender. So when you hear about the patriarchy, when you hear about, you know, um, uh, you know, a dominance of a certain gender over another, or even, you know, um, the same gender using their power against one another. That is gender-based violence. And it doesn't only need to be physical. As you can see, it could be spiritual, emotional, financial, the deprivation of something. That is, you know, gender-based violence. And so when you look at this slide, you know, there's so many little words and there's, you know, a cycle that you'll see. But, you know, when we, um, when you work with, you know, domestic violence, you may have heard about the power and control wheel. This is our version. It's a little bit different, but it shows how um, historically and just culturally and just also based on, you know, trauma within a community, there's a lifetime spiral of gender-based violence. And we like to talk, we, we prefer talking about gender-based violence and not just domestic violence or sexual violence, because often Often, abuse is not isolated. It's not just one time that um, an abusive situation happens. It can be, you know, further ongoing. It can be a child that witnesses abuse in their family and then goes on, you know, into an abusive relationship and then, you know, in turn has same behaviors of family violence in their family. It's not just one, you know, isolated uh, moment in time. It really is connected. And so this spiral shows the connectivity. And this spiral was developed at API GBV at our institute before my time. Um, but it was um, developed because survivors across the country detailed a lot of abuses that, had, that they had been exposed to before they came into a domestic violence organization. So similar to what I said earlier, and there are a range of abuses over which lifetime violence can happen. There's, like I mentioned, historical trauma. There's, you know, different types of abuses that girls and women are, you know, vulnerable to, perhaps female genital mutilation in certain communities. There are different perpetrators located across, you know, their lifespan. It can range from incest to a coach in school to then a pimp who is trafficking, you know, um, that someone to then elder abuse. So there's, you know, different perpetrators that happen in anyone's lifetime if they're a you know, survivor of gender-based violence. And the histories of abuse also prevent um, you know, or affect survivors from seeking help. 
For example, you may have heard of a situation where, you know, um, someone is molested, you know, in their um, childhood and then tell their parents about it. But then the parents, you know, don't listen or don't, you know, uh, believe what the child is saying because it could be a favorite uncle in the family. And so then that, you know, also will translate further on in life where if that person is victimized again, they won't tell somebody, they won't reach out for help. And that is what you know, this spiral really, you know, is wanting to show that, you know, it's all connected, you know, and it goes along the course of someone's lifespan if they, you know, are victimized at an early age. Um, next slide, please. And um, you'll see over here um, a really broad statistic, but it's one that, you know, we um, had discovered, you know, in our research that 21 to 55% of AAPI women experience physical and sexual violence in their lifetime. And, you know, the figure is so broad because again, um, the data is not disaggregated. And also um, it shows that the violence can really be um, any type of violence, whether, and you'll see the chart below where they're forced to engage in sexual relations with another person. They, you know, experience sexual harassment at work or school. And they're also pressured to engage in, sun, in, in an unwanted sexual act, or they experienced unwanted touching in public, or, um, you know, there's a subcategory also uh, of folks who have experienced no sexual violence. And this data, was collected by our, you know, um, you, a partnering organization, Can Win, um, and they had done their own survey as well and found this out with 313, um, you know, um, uh, people whom they've asked. So what I want to say also with this slide is here we have this statistic, but it is also known that in many communities, all communities, many people don't report the violence that they've suffered, you know, especially if it's family violence or especially if it's something that they may not even um, connect as, uh, as, as, you know, gender-based violence, it won't be reported, but it also won't be reported because of many fears of many systems, which we'll talk about later. So while this data point was collected, we also haven't captured those voices who have not spoken up about violence in their own, you know, um, lives due to many reasons, also due to shame, due to, you know, not wanting to say anything to keep it silent and secret. Next slide, Shirley. And um, so what I'd like to say um, about this slide is that even with the limited data that we have, um, when looking at homicide rates against AAPI women, 58% um, of homicides are tied to intimate partner violence where 47% were of a current partner. And so there's a lot of studies being done right now on, you know, on homicides and the connectivity to, you know, what is happening in the communities um, or, you know, what is happening with partners. You know, everyone right now in the news, you hear about, you know, the, uh, um, the most recent case with Gabby um, and, you know, they're searching right now for her you know, boyfriend whom, you know, is in Florida hiding. And so these are, you know, um, those are similar types of cases that, you know, we also uh, find in many, many communities in the indigenous community, in our community. And, you know, there's more uh, research being done on the connectivity of homicide and um, intimate partner violence. And so this figure, 58% um, of the homicides of AAPI women are done, are, are, you know, because of a partner is quite significant. It shows that it's not just someone, you know, um, a random act of violence. It's there's a connectivity. And we always, you know, think, what if we were able to make a difference and stop that homicide from happening before it turned into one? So I think that that's important as well to know. So that's why services, that's why connectivity, that's why, you know, having, you know, those resources at hand are really, really important, especially when um, you see this, you know, statistic. We also wanted to spend a little bit more time. We've talked about what gender-based violence is and the statistics connected to it, but it's also important to understand cultural barriers, which Shirley will be talking about next too. 
Thank you. Um, so, right, I will talk about cultural barriers in this next section, and then Monica afterwards will talk about some systems barriers. So before I do that, I want to take a minute to kind of pause and um, take a second to reflect just a couple, just a minute or so. And we want everybody in the group today to finish this sentence with as many things, as many identities, um, as many ways as you want. I identify as and go ahead and either shout it out in the chat if you're comfortable or just kind of reflect um, to yourself. For instance, uh, I, I identify as a child of immigrants. I identify as a West Coaster. I'm from California. I identify as an advocate and an ally, a night owl, uh, a Chinese American or just an American. Um, I identify as a coffee lover, a woman. Uh, Monica, would you want to share what you identify as? Um, yeah, absolutely, Shirley. Thank you. Um, so I identify as um, a um, heterosexual woman. I am a mother. I am also a child of immigrant parents who came when they were 18. I am a wife. I am a um, lawyer, um, also an executive director. And uh, I identify as someone who um, fights for uh, justice for uh, those who cannot fight for themselves. Love it. And I see someone in the chat put earthling. And I, I think that's something we all identify as, I hope. Um, so thank you for, you know, kind of reflecting on that. Um, the reason we're encouraging you to think of uh, the ways that you identify is if you think about all of your identities, whether that's, you know, being a mother, being a, um, you know, a night owl or an American, being AAPI, think of all the ways that these identities shape your life, every aspect of your life, um, behaviors, relationships, um, and then think about survivors of domestic violence or gender-based violence and how they might identify themselves as victims or survivors of violence, but also many other things, um, not just victims, right? And how these other identities that they hold may impact them, uh, may empower them, or may become barriers to them in the different ways um, as, they, as they heal from violence, as they seek help from the violence. So just kind of hold all of that in your mind. Um, so when we talk about AAPI experiences or, you know, not just AAPI, it could be, this could apply to any community. We're never talking about the experiences in a bubble. Our experiences, our communities and our identities all have multi-layered impacts upon our realities, which either broadens um, for some the choices that they have or for some uh, limits the choices that they have or the options that they have. Um, so this includes the histories of our communities, the trappings of the society that we live in. And here's where you can talk about racial justice and civil rights. For instance, um, our community norms and expectations, which come from our community cultures, uh, the systems that we live, that we're surrounded by. Um, so for instance, the criminal justice system, the healthcare system, the immigration system in the US, um, and the policies and procedures that these systems have. Um, our personal relationships with our partners and our families and the dynamics within those relationships, which, you know, again, comes from community and society um, and history. Um, and then, of course, uh, at the most narrow level, our individual beliefs and our internalized beliefs. And all of these have an impact on survivors' experiences and the choices that they're able to make um, and the choices that they do make. So, again... Uh, the experiences across the AAPI diaspora vary, but here are some dynamics that we've seen over and over again uh, within AAPI communities. Um, so many of them have experiences with generational trauma related to uh, colonization, historical oppression, or forced assimilation. So we've heard stories um, from AAPI folks uh, of children getting hit at school for speaking, um, for speaking a non-English language. Uh, forced to wear traditional clothing and, and the, um, you know, forced assimilation to, I guess, U.S. culture. 
Uh, many communities have experienced state violence or civil war. And of course, we know that there's a lot of um, violence that's been used. Rape, for instance, has unfortunately been a, a tool of war and terror for, for centuries. Um, the displacement that comes with state violence and civil war um, or you know any any type of war, any type of conflict, um, and throughout the displace um, throughout the journey of becoming a refugee and getting displaced, you can imagine all the the points where somebody may experience um, violence or gender based violence. Um, for instance, from a from a soldier in a camp, from a stranger in a camp, um, and so on. And in many AAPI communities, knowledge and learning. Um, about family, about stability, uh, community well-being. These are things that are traditionally passed through generations, taught by the elders to the younger generations. And as a result of um, all of this above, uh, this traditional learning has been disrupted. So as this quote from a Native Hawaiian uh, advocate references, um, instead of that knowledge, that traditional knowledge, now you're just passing toxic relationships, the cycle of violence with children learning um, these behaviors, uh, violence from parents, uh, which has a long-term long impact on the health and well-being of the community overall. So we've seen a little bit of this in the lifetime spiral, but in AAPI communities, there's often multiple harm doers, as Monica mentioned. Uh, and the harm doers are often members of the survivor's own family. Um, it could be their sisters, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins, um, and so on. We've heard uh, the same story time and time again, where a survivor, um, you know, finally reaches out for help from a community or, you know, discloses to, um, you know, somebody, a friend or a church leader, um, what's happened to her over the course of many, many years. Um, and the moment she reaches out for help, what happens? Uh, her sisters, her cousins, her aunts all turn against her. Um, they ostracize her from the family because uh, the perception is that she, the survivor who reached out for help, she is the one who betrayed the family and the marriage. Um, she couldn't keep the family together. She aired the dirty laundry. Um, and, you know, I do say she in this situation because while uh, domestic violence and gender based violence also can affect men and boys, um, this type of story that we hear is overwhelmingly um, the victim is a woman. Um, so there's many intersections also with abusive international marriages or transnational abandonments. Um, for instance, an abuser purposely stranding a survivor in the US or in the home country without documentation, without money, um, without ability to get back to um, where they need to be and be reunited with children and family. Um, sometimes men marry in another country and force his wife uh, to tolerate this marriage. Um, oftentimes the marriage in, in another country, in the home country is with a, um, a minor. Um, the children uh, forced marriage, so often children are being forced to marry against their will by parents or family members, uh, which we do consider a form of gender-based violence. Um, and then using honor as a justification for abuse is something that we've seen pretty often. Uh, using honor as a means to keep the survivor silent, saying that if you seek a divorce or if you tell somebody, you're shaming the entire family or the entire community. So these are just some kind of top level um, trends that we see. In a similar way, using religion as a justification for violence, and this can happen, I wanna stress across, you know, in any religion, this can happen. Uh, keeping a survivor isolated from their community and from their family. Um, it, culturally, many AAPI individuals have a strong dependence or a strong connection to, you know, family and community, and this can be very um, harmful to them. Um, in many AAPI communities, there's a big variance as far as how women and girls should behave versus how men and boys should behave. Uh, sons are generally more valued. Um, boys are supposed to be decisive. They're supposed to be dominant and strong. Uh, the daughter's virtues have more to do with, um, you know, being temper, um, temperance, tolerance, patience, humility, you know, and so you can imagine um, somebody saying to their their child or their daughter, you know, tolerate the violence, um, you know, be patient with him. 
uh, there's still a lot of intolerance for LGBTQ or gender non-conforming or GNC individuals, which means that queer or trans survivors often find it more safe to stay with their abusive partner than to return to their families or their communities who, who either are tossing them out or forcing them to marry uh, in a heterosexual relationship, um, right? So the queer and trans AAPI survivors often um, face more isolation because they don't have that safety um, place to go to. Um, to get away from their abuser. And there's a lot of stigma towards divorced women, uh, seeing divorced women, especially divorced women with kids, as uh, undesirable or even used. Um, the same stigma does not apply generally to divorced men in the same way. Uh, some more dynamics, uh, relationships and sex are things that you're not supposed to talk about with anybody outside of your relationship, uh, definitely not in public. And if you do bring up um, relationship issues, there are people that you're supposed to go to depending on you know, the cultural community. It may be the church leaders, it may be the community elders or other cultural elders. Um, and these folks tend to be uh, hold more traditional values and what they say generally is to urge to keep the family together, focusing on the family unit over the survivor's well-being. Uh, there's still a lot of stigma, uh, stigma around mental illness and substance abuse. Uh, abuse both of which can result from um, violence, from being a survivor of violence. Um, and so taken all together, all of these community norms and barriers are telling survivors that being a victim of violence is something that is embarrassing. Uh, and doing anything but keeping the silence is something that's even more embarrassing. And you know what's interesting is that on the other hand, it being somebody who who conducts or perpetrates violence upon somebody else isn't seen as embarrassing in, in the same way. So um, essentially this kind of explains a lot of the, the silencing that happens, the stigma and the silencing surrounding violence that happens in AAPI communities that contributes to a lot of the, the low reporting rates. Um, I think, oh, I do have one more slide. Um, so here, um, I wanted to close this section with this quote from um, a client, a survivor at Texas Muslim Women's Foundation, who is another one of our, our partners over in Texas. Um, and I guess I'll just read it. It says, I grew up with violence. My, uh, my father hit my mother. My grandfather hit grandmother. My brothers abused their wives. My sister was abused. I was supported by my female family members until I reached out for help. They said I was betraying the family honor by reaching out. If I go back to my country, my brother will surely kill me. I was married to my first cousin. So I, I think this quote kind of rolls up a lot of what we've been talking about, where the abuse is passed through the generations historically, where it's so um, deeply rooted that you can't look beyond it, uh, you can't look back in your generations without seeing violence, that it becomes normalized in communities, that it just becomes part of, you know, part of how relationships are thought of being, um, how somebody's family members, own family members, even their female relatives um, don't support, you know, the survivor, how honor plays a factor as a justification, um, and then the survivor uh, was obviously, or I think seemed like a, a victim of forced marriage as well. Okay, passing it to Monica. Thank you, Shirley. Um, that is so, um, you know, so important when we talk about, you know, uh, you know what the barriers are. And before I um, head into system barriers, Monica, do we have any questions? Well, there, I don't see any in the Q&A, but I have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with all of these um, sort of barriers and things that are, you know, the traditions, culture, so many things impacting um, people's ability to report. I'm wondering 
how do people get to you? Is it, you know, kind of sort of, is it different than how we might traditionally see with other populations? Is it word of mouth from people within the community? I'm very curious about that. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and, you know, working in direct services before I joined API GBV, I could see firsthand that, you know, it is varied. You know, sometimes it's from trusted individuals. Sometimes it can be from faith-based leaders. It can be from, you know, um, friends who have built trust, neighbors who have built trust over time. You know, normally the, you know, statistic is it takes uh, seven tries for a victim of domestic violence to leave their abusive situation. And so that's just for mainstream organizations. And when you look at it culturally, the trust really has to build. And so I think, you know, um, I'm going to go into system barriers, but very rarely, you know, I would say it does happen, but you may not see courts or systems or law enforcement leading a victim, you know, very, you know, just directly to a direct services organization or a shelter for help, even going to a shelter for help for our community um, has its own challenges. And so it really is in a variety of ways. And that's why if we know victims are going to faith-based leaders, we have projects with certain, you know, churches and, you know, areas of worship where we also educate the um, faith-based leaders on what gender-based violence looks like in their role in it as well. And so it's really important to um, just know that there's a variety of ways and trust is the most important way to get, you know, a, you know, survivor or, you know, out of the situation that they're in. Great. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And um, thank you for that question, Monica, because it really segues for our next, you know, uh, section, which is systems barriers. And so there are many, you know, system barriers, you know, in the United States and also back home, you know, and from the home countries where um, survivors may not feel very, um, you know, easy to try to access law enforcement, TPOs, or, um, you know, uh, you know, other folks in these powerful positions that could help them because, you know, of some of, you know, not only the barriers that they face in the U.S., but the challenges that were in their home country. So as, you know, an Indian American myself, I was born and raised in the United States, but I heard of the challenges in India back home in, you know, needing to go to the police officer if you needed assistance, of maybe bribing a police officer to assist, you know, a perpetrator or going to a police officer and a police officer doing nothing. And that was back home in India. But being born and raised here, I even heard of those challenges. And I can only imagine when I was, you know, you know, being, you know, in a country like that where there is corruption, where law enforcement may not be on your side, you're already set up when you come to the United States to, States to not trust. But we actually do have many systemic, you know, um, barriers right now for um, many, you know, of the AAPI community and also immigrant community. And so while our focus today is on the AAPI community, this next section also can be, you know, taken for immigrant, you know, survivors as well. And so the one big one that we have, which is on the next slide, is language access. You know, whenever um, we do any surveys, whenever we speak to direct services organizations, language access has been problematic for many of our um you know, survivors in the AAPI community. And, you know, it's the largest barrier, I would say, in the AAPI community and immigrant community when seeking services. If you were to, you know, take this situation, and I've seen this happen many times, where, you know, um, even getting over the trust issues, if, um, a, you know, immigrant from the AAPI community were to call 911 and a police officer comes. Rarely does that police officer come, you know, with um, someone who speaks the same language as, you know, the, um, you know, uh, survivor calling. And usually what ends up happening is the perpetrator, the one who does speak English, ends up speaking for the survivor. What do you think happens then? Do you think the right information is being said 
Probably not. Probably information has been turned around. And so the law enforcement officer who comes to help doesn't, you know, is then sent away and is, you know, the opportunity to help is then taken away. And so that's why language access is really, really important. And here is a graph which shows the communities that have responded to their English proficiency. You can see that within the AAPI community, there is a vast difference. You see the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community also speaking English, but then when you go to the Vietnamese population, only 50% have, you know, a really good substantive um, handle on English. And so to lump all the data into AAPI does not reflect the actual breakdown, but it's important for us to know which populations require more assistance with language. And that's something that we really talk about, you know, at API GBV. The next slide will also show you um, a story about a Spanish speaking woman, you know, who, um, you know, then had to tackle, you know, speaking, you know, navigating through the systems, through, um, you know, um, you know, uh, through law enforcement, then through court without really understanding English or her rights and the court not even providing her with that, you know, um, assistance and the language was Spanish. So you can imagine, you know, with Spanish being the second most common language in the United States and not being able to provide it. What happens if someone speaks Tibetan or Korean sign language? Do you think that, you know, um, systems have the capacity or even desire to want to provide that. Being an immigration attorney and seeing how quickly the courts want to move, there have been many times where courts and law enforcement have tried to, you know, just kind of get things going and, uh, you know, forego any translation. But the one thing that I want to say is that it is, you know, um, a legal right under Title VI to make sure that interpretation is there, especially for courts, especially for, you know, when trying to seek any form of relief. And of course, in immigration court, we have to have interpreters. And sometimes, you know, we've had to ask for different interpreters if interpreters come from the same community, because we know that um, the survivor will not want to be open if everyone in the community may have access to hearing her story. So, you know, language access is something that we all need to think about. Maybe in certain, you know, um, cities like, you know, New York, Queens, San Francisco, you may be able to find the variety of interpreters in the AAPI community, but I can tell you, coming from Atlanta, Georgia, working with folks in Louisiana or Missouri, you will not find, um, you know, those um, interpreters, and it can really be a hindrance and a, you know, barrier for many of our, you know, um, survivors leaving their situation. Um, next slide. So um, here are, you know, um, some shortcuts that, you know, are used when trying to provide language access, but it's something that we want to encourage folks not to do, even if they're in this situation. And I have seen this happen multiple times. I probably have been guilty of doing number two and three a few times, but it's something that is, you know, a practice that we really are trying to get away from because language access and language justice, and we haven't even spoken about language justice, but it really is language justice is a newer terminology for language access and really uh, many attorneys are, um, you know, and a lot of legal aid attorneys are really understanding the term language justice, because if you want to provide a survivor the best opportunity for um, expressing themselves, that is what language justice is, not just language access, which is, you know, a little peep into, you know, providing services. Language justice is the ultimate. And, you know, um, Language access and justice is a key to survivors' request for assistance and recovery. And like I mentioned, there are laws that legally obligate a court law enforcement to provide an interpreter. And, you know, you can see on this slide um, some ways to provide meaningful access and interpretation and not to. And I have seen many iterations of these examples, but the one that I see the most is having a bilingual advocate or family member translate. And the reason why you don't want um, and it's not best practice to use a bilingual advocate as an interpreter is because an advocate is an advocate. 
right? They're supposed to be there to provide the support and assistance to a survivor. Once they start, you know, translating, it puts the advocate in a role of really being more than an advisor. And then the, you know, it, it hinders some empowerment and uplifting also of the survivor because that one advocate is everything to that survivor. And it deepens the relationship to one just than just of an advocate, which is why we often encourage advocates not to be interpreters, but we've seen it happen if it's in a court situation, if it's in an emergency situation where it's needed, but you know, it's best practice is not to. And why wouldn't you allow a family member to be the interpreter, especially a child? You know, you don't want to have a dynamic where a child could be vicariously traumatized by what you are saying or what the you know survivor is hearing. And as an interpreter for my parents, and I was not in a domestic violence, you know, situation or a gender-based violence situation, it puts a lot of responsibility on the child when they're constantly having to, you know, um, interpret for their um, family members, but also if it is something that is really big, like gender-based violence, you really want to keep that separate. So as a practice, I would always separate the children from, you know, the parents when working with them. Um, I'm spending a little bit more time on this slide, but it's something that we really want to make sure that we, you know, hit upon. Along with language access, you know, um, barriers, there's also immigration system barriers, which is, you know, important to say, you know, right now, especially after the last four years where immigrants were targeted almost on a daily basis, there have been, you know, many changes that have really deeply affected the processing time of applications. So if there are applications you can file immigration-wise if you're a victim of gender-based violence, but it takes a very long time, some applications can take as long as 10 years. And because the systems over the last four years have been backlogged, especially the immigration court system, it takes a long time to even process an asylum case. And these cases are very early urgent cases. You hear what's been happening in Afghanistan. You know, those cases um, were processed pretty quickly because of the manpower put in, but still not quick enough. And so it's really important to note that, you know, when you have, um, you know, a backlog of cases and there's so much happening immigration-wise, it's going to affect victims of gender-based violence and puts them in dangerous situations for even longer because they can't access immigration protections that they need. They can't access work authorization. They can't access a driver's license. So they're still in that very dangerous situation. The last four years have been have brought about complex, you know, changes in laws and policies and rules. I mean, you've been hearing about what's been happening at the border, about more detentions. You've also heard about, you know, maybe remain in Mexico while you're filing for asylum cases all of that has an impact, you know, and those were really extreme changes in policies from what had been done previously. And now even, you know, we're trying to, you know, come out of it, but there have been some still difficult immigration policy changes as well. And, you know, all of these, you know, immigration forms of relief have an emphasis on working with systems. You can only apply for certain immigration statuses if you're an immigration, if you're a victim of gender based violence, if you've worked with law enforcement, if you can show you're a victim of human trafficking, if you can, you know, say that um, as a victim of domestic violence, you work with your local police. And so those systems, which are as we mentioned, barriers create even more barriers. And so while I spent a little bit of time talking about immigration system barriers, the next slide will show really how complex it is. And we're not gonna, I could be here all day if I unpacked every single um, you know, box, I'm not gonna do that. But just to show that's an immigration roadmap on even how to obtain your uh, green card status, your legal permanent resident status. And it's very, complex and very difficult. And so I always say, you know, if it is something that is immigration related, you need to talk to an immigration expert because this slide alone will show you how. Our next slide also talks about, you know, um, you know how difficult it is to even report 
if you've been, you know, um, a victim or um, of domestic violence. So we did a survey in 2019 with a partner, um, with with um, a, through a partnership with our other organizations, and we surveyed almost 600 advocates and attorneys who worked with immigrant survivors. And the survey shows that. Um, a lot of um, immigrant survivors fear the system more than they even fear their abuser, which goes back to what Shirley and I were saying about why. And since 2019, as I mentioned, there's been important shifts in immigration policy. Um, so that made folks even more fearful. I know many clients who said, I'm not going to file anything right now because under you know, the last administration, many of my options were taken away. And as as an immigration attorney, I couldn't blame clients for saying that. But now that immigration law has been shifting a little bit, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens with these survey results if we were to do a survey in another year or two, because a lot of what this administration has been trying to do um, is, you know, redo some of your, or, you know, undo I should say, undo some of what has happened in the past administration, except they still haven't, you know, figured out the border crisis just yet. But in terms of domestic violence, you know, applications and what's been happening, they have been trying to, um, you know, throw away some of the policies, you know, such as the domestic violence and asylum policy that was really a hard one that Jeff Sessions had passed, you know, at the last administration. Um, and then finally, you know, it's not just immigration or language access where there are barriers. There are other systems in place that our AAPI, you know, um, survivors have difficulty in accessing. Social services is difficult. Can you imagine telling your whole, you know, um, you know, past and your trauma in a language that is not your own? So finding even social services in specific languages are very difficult. Child protection systems um, is, you know, very difficult as well. For many of our refugee clients, that's the first thing that we educate on because child protective services is very different here than it could be in a home country like Somalia or like Burma. And so child protective services also is another system that's very difficult for our, you know, clients to navigate. And usually the perpetrator who may have more of the power can navigate that um, favorably for their um, own, you know, um, purpose. The criminal and civil justice system also is confounding and confusing even for us. So imagine how it is for somebody who can't speak the same language, who has a fear of systems, who doesn't understand all the court dates, all the continuances and what is happening and the need to show up and why, you know, um, you know, the purpose, why their abuser even has to be, you know, um, in jail sometimes, because maybe jail isn't what they want. They just want the violence to stop and jail could be something different. And then of course, healthcare and housing, I could go into that, but I think, you know, housing of course, under, you know, the pandemic has really, um, you know, been a big one where many of um, our AAP client, AAPI clients have had difficulty in finding housing and paying their rent under the pandemic. Um, so these are other systems that many um, of our clients have, you know, difficulty, you know, and even um, understanding. Shirley, I'm going to send it back to you. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about, um, you know, what is our response or what is our um, the, the way that we respond to all of these barriers that we've spent the last many slides going over. Um, and we really advocate for uh, what we call or what the field calls culturally responsive services. Sometimes it's also referred to as culturally specific services, culturally relevant services. There's a couple different uh, names that, that it, um, we kind of go back and forth between. But uh, in terms of culturally specific services, um, well, we really see it as um, ability to respond to survivors um, while being mindful of the culture that they're coming from, the barriers that they're facing as a result of these cultures, the challenges, um, and to be able to respond in a way that doesn't tokenize or stereotype their culture, that doesn't 
say don't say things like I thought that was normal in your culture I thought men or women in your culture were always this way but that really um, looks at what the survivor needs and what the survivors um, you know where the survivor is coming from so we've mentioned this a couple of times throughout the presentation but you know we do learn from over 160 direct service agencies uh, that provide culturally responsive services to Asians and Pacific Islanders. Um, they're located across the US, the Asian Pacific Development Center is one of them. Uh, and also there's a handful in the territories as well. Um, so these uh, agencies are community organizations. Um, many of them have domestic violence shelters um, many of them do legal representation or case management. So this is where a survivor would go um, for help, for support, for services um, in response to the violence that they're experiencing. Um, and uh, so these are the folks that are on the ground, you know, every day doing this work who are interfacing with survivors every day. Um, so these are the people that we learn from in our work at the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. Here uh, we see these folks as the experts and we do our best to kind of learn uh, what they're seeing on the ground and then take these needs, take these trends and amplify them um, in advocacy nationwide. And also, you know, to, to help build networks among these agencies. So here's a little bit of um, what we mean when we are talking about uh, culturally responsive services. So here's a, def a couple of different photos from different agencies um, that were on that map in the previous slide. Um, and so on the top left, you're going to see um, a support circle that's hosted by the Domestic Violence Action Center. They are an amazing organization in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, and what you're really gonna notice here is that uh, this is a support circle for survivors of domestic violence, but you see that there's children in the photo. Um, you see that the, the circle is hosted outside, um, you know, where the beach is, where there's trees and a park. Um, and so what that really gets at is we've learned from, you know, the Asian or the Domestic Violence Action Center that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander survivors, um, things like family, family connection, the land and the ocean have very deep, very deep cultural meaning for them. And so um, it's very meaningful for them to be able to hold these services in a physical space where you're in tune with the land and the ocean. Um, that's, um, it means more to them than just doing it in a, you know, in a room, in, a, in an office building or something like that. And the other aspect of this is bringing in the entire family. Um, for a, uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, when you heal the survivor, that means healing the entire family. You can't heal the survivor without healing the entire family. And so in recognition of these cultural factors, um, that's why they hold these support circles outside. And that is culturally responsive um, services. At the top right, this is a, um, a support group hold, held by Bantiestre in Oakland, California, which is a, a neighbor of mine. Um, they, uh, and a lot of AAPI agencies um, weave cultural music, cultural food, and the preparation of cultural food and you know, the, the doing of cultural crafts and cultural music into their support group um, as kind of like a, a vehicle for building trust, for um, bridging the, you know, bridging the gap between folks, making the connections. And that's something that, you know, when the survivors come in, the survivors say like, you know, this feels like home. It feels like there's not a lot of barriers. I feel like I can trust, you know, and open up more. Um, I feel more connected with where I'm coming from and my roots. So that again is another example of culturally responsive advocacy. Um, this picture at the bottom left is um, from Iowa, uh, Monsoon Asians and Pacific Islanders in Solidarity. Um, what they do is they hold a community garden where um, youth in the community uh, come and show up and they, they do gardening with the elders of, you know, Southeast Asian elders. And, you know, the task at hand is gardening, but throughout that experience of just, you know, being in, in the space and gardening, um, what you're really doing is building community. You're passing on cultural learning, you're passing on, you know, um, 
relationships, right? And so it's interesting because a lot of AAPI um, agencies, they're not just domestic violence and sexual assault agencies, they're not just shelters. They are really community organizers, community strengtheners. Um, and I think, I don't remember, I think it was Monica earlier, maybe it was Rita who asked the question about how, um, you know, how survivors come to agencies for help. Um, one of the biggest ways is, you know, they, they don't come, they don't show up to an agency saying, I'm a survivor of violence, I need help. They show up to the community garden, they show up to a literacy class, they show up to like some cultural event. Um, they may sh keep showing up um, over a course of years um, and eventually the trust is built so that they're, you know, they, they're able to disclose by the way, I'm also a survivor of violence. So what these uh, community-based organizations do is really build trust, build support within the community. Um, and they're a community resource, not only for domestic violence and sexual assault and gender-based violence, but also for you know, all other aspects. And I hope it's become clear through you know, the rest of our presentation that survivors of violence are not just needing you know, their, their needs are multi-layered. Um, there's, uh, they may not just need, you know, a protection order or shelter. They have very multifaceted needs related to their multiple identities. And so what the uh, community-based organizations do a great job of is just providing all of the holistic services all across the board um, that survivors would need for their experiences. Um, they're good at, they're great at understanding all of what a survivor would need um, and approaching the survivor, um, you know, where they are. So for instance, they provide childcare, transportation, accompanying somebody to court, um, you know, imagine as a survivor, how, how traumatizing and, and um, intimidating showing up to court would be. Um, so the advocate would accompany the survivor to court and help them navigate. navigate. Uh, obviously immigration services, burial services, if somebody is um, the victim of a domestic violence related homicide in some cultures and communities, burial is um, deeply meaningful um, aspect of the culture. And a lot of times what happens is the abuser will not let the, the survivor, not survivor, the victim's family, um, you know, bury bury the victim. And so um, burial services is an important service that a lot of agencies provide. Uh, cultural programs, as we've seen on the last slide, social enterprise to build up, um, build up financial literacy, financial freedom, and then literacy classes, both like uh, ESL, English literacy, and also financial literacy. Um, just recognizing all the different needs and all the challenges that survivors have. And back to Monica. Yes, and so um, I know that we are nearing the end of our time and I wanted to give new men um, an opportunity, of course, to really share what's happening in Colorado. The rest of, um, we just have a few slides left on, you know, what's happening currently, but we can fold that in a little bit later. But Monica Bees, you had mentioned that there might be a question for us before I hand it over to new men, or we can maybe do that question later. I'll take my marching orders from you. Well, how's this? I will uh, let you know what the question is, and it may be that you're planning to get to some of this next time. I'm not sure. Or you can give a quick something or where to find something. Sure. Um, so a question related to the system's barriers, aside from language barriers, is there any research or understanding on cultural biases affecting first respond, uh, responders to DV calls in the AAPI community? You know, that's a great question. And, you know, I would love, I, I, I know there is, I haven't come prepared with that today, but we can have that ready for the next week's um, uh, okay. webinar as well. And I can look into it and make sure I give a really full answer, but there has been research done. And yes, there's always cultural biases, individual biases, whenever first responders come. And so some of the cultural re relevancy and responsive trainings that we do also hit those notes as well. Great, thank you. All right, well, with that, are, are you all finished, Monica? Yeah, Monica we'll be done. yes, we'll be done. And then we can hit some of it next time. Just um, we wanted to talk a little bit next time about what we're seeing now that what you're hearing in the news and all that. 
but I know Newman will go over that a little bit. So we'll, um, you know, pass it over to Newman. And thank you all so much from Shirley and us. And Newman, it is all yours. <laughs> there you go. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, that was a great presentation. And I was going to continue to let you, you know, drive the show if needed. Um, but yes, I, so my name is Newman Lee, and I'm the Victim Assistant Director at the Asian Pacific Development Center. Um, basically, on um, this portion of the um, webinar, we'll kind of talk about what um, APDC, specifically within the Victim Assistant Department, has been seen, um, and kind of our overall services. A lot of the stuff that was actually mentioned on just direct services in a culturally specific, culturally responsive agency, um, such as APDC. Wonderful. Uh, so yes, um, we'll be kind of talking about the local realities and local resources. Um, and kind of go from there. But I'm also very cautious with time. And so if we need to, if there's any questions or if there's anything that, you know, we need to dive into more, I, I'll be here next time for the next um, portion of this on the 27th. So hope to see you all there. So diversity in Colorado. Um, right now, with the most recent, recent uh, census, we are at 5.7 million people in Colorado right now. Uh, let me go ahead and change this so then, okay. Well, hopefully you all can see that. Um, so the top languages that we are seeing at APDC um, when it comes to requests of interpretation as well, um, kind of similar to what is actually being reported, uh, is Spanish, Chinese, German, Vietnamese, and French. Oftentimes, uh, individuals come to APDC asking for just uh, translated material or materials on services, and these are usually the requested uh, language that is uh, asked from other agency as well as communities themselves. Um, and then meant to say top uh, five uh, countries of origins, uh, when it comes to um, diversity, we have individuals from Mexico, India, Vietnam, China, and South Korea. And they are, and understanding that Oftentimes, when we're talking about accessibility of services and having culturally responsive services, it might be very limited depending on the geographic location that you're at. Um, and then another st st statistics that we see um, is that 88% of um, the population is U.S. born, while 5.9% are non-U.S as well as 3.9 naturalized citizen um, and 1.3 born abroad to US citizen parent. Now with the naturalized citizen, just in case you're not aware, these are individuals who are um, refugees or immigrant or asylee that has been granted naturalization to be an American citizen. I am a naturalized citizen uh, of the US. So, this is our own personal case statistics uh, from our victim assistant department. This is not reflective of um, APDC uh, as an agency as a whole, but 41% of our clients that we've seen from 2019 and 2020 um, has spoke a different language uh, when seeking services with us. We have about 30% of our clients from uh, 2019 to 2020 that needs uh, language services to access other services within APDC. And I'll go more into that be just because the Victim Assistant Department at APDC is only one of five other uh, departments within the agency. 21% uh, of our clients receive mobile advocacy service, which is uh, something that is specific to our victim assistant department, where we will meet with clients figuratively as well as literally, understanding that transportation is a barrier to a lot of our community members and being able to go to them as opposed to having them come to the office, as opposed to um, waiting for someone to knock at the door. We understand that sometimes we have to be in the community to provide the service directly. Um, and then 67% uh, of our clients does need transportation assistance 
or coordination to access other services uh, within Colorado as well as within APDC. And then with that, 36% of um, all the clients we see are foreign born. So um, I have this slide for intersectionality on here, which really ties back to what Monica and Shirley was talking about regarding um, how do you identify as you know, an individual, that intersectionality is what limits and create barriers and challenges for many of us um, that have various multiple um, identities and that there's always going to be a system that we are trying to go against as well as access. And so to do that, we have to address the intersectionality of that individual as well as the family unit and the community itself uh, to really understand what survivors of crime are going through and how do we best support them in that culturally specific as well as linguistically appropriate um, manner. Um, with that, I will kind of just tie it into the Asian Pacific development itself. Um, and I'll, I'll read to you all our uh, mission and vision statement. So the Asian Pacific Development Center is powered by its rich heritage of AANHPI advocacy and exists today to serve and support all immigrant and refugee communities with a whole health community-based engagement approach through health education and advocacy. Our vision is for our communities to be healthy and empowered. I'll dive into kind of the definition of A and HPI because uh, that's oftentimes the question. And um, so it's Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. Again, all these are acronyms and terminology that is it can be fluid and depending on who you talk to and how they identify in uh, the community itself. But APDC um, has been uh, was founded in 1980 uh, and. If you look historically, nationally, many Asian um, agencies was founded around the same time when there was this big influx of um, Asian refugees and immigrants shortly after the Vietnam War, where there was a lot of Southeast um, immigrants and immigration coming through. But then with that, there was this gap of services and gap of addressing the trauma that these individuals and communities were bringing to the United States. And so APDC was created um, originally as a behavioral health mental health center. From there, they've brought it up and really open it up to um, making sure that services are culturally and linguistically appropriate, addressing language and cultural barrier, generational issues, and other social um, determinants that are affecting immigrant communities as a whole. Um, with that, it means you do not have to be Asian to receive services at APDC. Oftentimes people hear, you know, the Asian Pacific Development Center and they wonder, well, I'm not Asian. Can I get services? Do I have to pay for it if, you know, I'm not? And so breaking down kind of that, um, the name of it, uh, you do not have to be Asian or an immigrant or a refugee to receive services. We are a community-based organization that is here for the community. Um, and our approach, similar to what Monica had brought up, is in this holistic approach in addressing the whole person and just understanding that a lot of our communities function as a unit. That is not just only the individual, but also the family itself and how the family can translate to the whole uh, community. Um, Quickly over what we kind of do within APDC, we do a lot of interagency referral. Um, our main, one of our main goals is to really establish and build rapport within the AA and HPI uh, refugee immigrant communities, but also to become a resource to other service provider. Uh, we are a statewide uh, community-based agency, so we're able to work um, outside of specific jurisdiction uh, within the state. Uh, we are all grant funded, and that's kind of where uh, we're able to move and navigate as needed for our community members. These are some of the departments um, within APDC. We have adult education, uh, behavioral health as a uh, was that I had brought up. Our Colorado Language Connection is our interpreter translator bank where we utilize uh, and uh, 
to provide interpretation, to provide translation of materials. Uh, and that's what we use within the victim assistance department for our own interpreter that we would pay through our funding um, and whatnot. And uh, Colorado Language Connection is actually our for profit side of APDC. And then, of course, the victim assistance department. And then we have the Youth Leadership Academy. All of this was everything that Monica and Shirley brought up about the form and structure that is created in many of these uh, community-based resource and organization. So we have the youth, the um, adult ed that helps with employment, that helps with uh, citizenship, as well as, you know, uh, the victim assistant department, and then, you know, that language connection and interpretation and translation availability. So this is... Um, now, specifically with my department, this is the victim assistant department. So our victim assistant department is the only community-based grant funded program that specifically supports underserved and underrepresented AAPI victims of crime. Um, however, our service also expands to refugee and immigrants and other racial groups who may face other challenges. Um, with that being said, we serve all survivors of crime, understanding that victims of crime uh, experience, uh, experience uh, poly victimization, that we're not just domestic violence, human trafficking and sexual assault, but understanding that there may be child abuse as part of it. There may be identity theft as part of it. All of these trauma that and stressor that compounds an individual to be in the situation and how do we help support uh, the individual, the family and um, the community. We have four different satellite offices. Our main office is in Aurora, but we do have a satellite office in Denver at the Rose Ammon Center. Um, we have one up in Evans, uh, which is Screely, and then another one in Golden uh, or Lakewood with the Porchlight Family Justice Center. Understanding that we need to be in different communities for individuals to access our services. I can do all these presentations all day long, but if I'm not there and if my advocates are not there and available for individuals to do walk-in or to just be able to connect with a, a different agency that is already there, they may not know about us or they may not know that the services is there for them. Uh, so the main thing when it when we talk about direct services is really talking about and with our direct service, we want to make sure that we are very victim center and trauma informing the way we speak with our survivors. With that being said, there's also potentially that language barrier as well as that cultural barrier. Uh, but the main thing is we want to make sure that we have, you know, a victim advocate that does the case management coordination. All of us, all of our services are free and confidential um, with privilege for victim advocacy. We, of course, do safety planning um, with all of our uh, survivors. Um, and we make, you know, we have a lot of partnerships and networks to provide referrals to other agency. We are not a shelter. Uh, and so, you know, understanding that housing was a big issue, especially during COVID time, we understand that having some of those partnership established ahead of time is very important for our communities. Of course, um, as I brought up, you know, being able to educate and navigate with our victims around, you know, Victims Right Act um, in Colorado, understanding, um, that there are, you know, ways to navigate different system and accessing and trying to um, not have those barriers, systems barriers that we'll discuss uh, and be there to accompany as well as guide the survivor. And then we do have a small part of uh, emergency financial assistance that we do provide directly to the survivor, knowing that Waiting for paperwork can take a while. In the meantime, how are they going to afford grocery? How are they going to get that bus pass? How are they going to be able to, you know, we're heading into winter, get winter clothing. All of those are something that we can provide right then and there. Um, and how do you refer a client? Clients can be referred online um, through a crisis phone or walk into any of those centers. Um, all of our referral are done online. Uh, right now it's in English. We are working to get the site uh, 
translate it into other uh, languages. But we also understand that technology is an issue uh, and can be a complication for our community members. So, you know, being able to go out there and do a lot of these trainings so that we can help service provider community members to know like these are some access point. That's what we want to do. With our crisis phone, the individual can call and text us um, and we'll be able to communicate with them right then and there. We also have a language line so that if someone is calling a different language, we're able to connect and speak to them as opposed to not knowing what's going on. Um, frequently asked question. Again, you do not have to be Asian to receive services. Um, and this applies to all of the departments, not just only the victim assistance department. Specifically with my department, it has to be, the individual has to be a victim of crime. Um, other than that, um, we don't have any other eligibility. Uh, there does not need to be a police report, understanding that, again, a lot of our community members are afraid to engage in systems. And so if they're able to come to us, talk to us, feel comfortable in wanting to engage, we can help work through that. But until then, uh, if they're coming and saying that, you know, this is what I'm experiencing, what are my options, we will believe them and go on that path as needed. Um, this is our team, small and mighty. We have two interns that join, uh, and we're hoping to add another 1.5 uh, later on this year. And that is it. A little bit over time, but I am passing it back to you all. All right. Well, we are a little over time. So I think really just a, a big thanks to Monica, Shirley, and New Min uh, for being here with us today. And we really look forward to next week. Uh, if people look in the chat, you will see that uh, we posted the link if you would like to come to the workshop, which is a little more in depth and a little more interactive next week. We would love to have you. Um, did anybody want to add anything from the panelists? Okay, everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you, have a good day.